and bless you because you are a wonderful God. Lord, this year we are going to be change agents for you in Jesus' name. We are going to bring sinners unto the Lord in Jesus' name. We are going to create joy in heaven in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. We remain standing as we pray together. Father, we thank you for this Saturday workers' training meeting. We thank you for your people, our brothers and sisters, leaders and workers, both here and in all the other places we are gathered together. We are asking, Lord, that you will reach our understanding in Jesus' name. And we pray that you will be doers of the word. And the husband, man that laboreth, will be first partakers of the fruit. That what we are teaching other people, we ourselves will partake us of in Jesus' name. Lift up your people. Encourage your people. Enlighten your people. And Lord, we pray that you pour your spirit upon us. That will teach with understanding. And when we go to lead other people, we we'll lead them into the things of the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Bless us and use us to bless other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 2. I was looking at the whole chapter at really, but we're looking at verse 8 to start with. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. By grace are you saved. We know about the grace of God, that the mercy of God unmerited. That's the love of God demonstrated through Jesus Christ at Calvary. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, Whosoever, however deep in sin, however far the person might have gone, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he says, by that grace, the free gift of God, are we saved, whether it's a Paul, or it's a Peter, a John, or a James, somebody far away, or somebody near, whether yourself or myself, by grace are you saved. And then he says, through faith, the grace had been there all along. But then it takes an act of faith that you will stretch out your hand of faith, having trust in God, having confidence in God, that whosoever comes to him, he will in no wise reject, and that he is faithful to his promise. And because of that faithfulness, you can come confidently and be saved through faith. And after you are saved, you understand. It is not by works, lest any man should boast. And then it says, now we are saved, we are grateful to God. This is all free because of what Christ has done. But it has consequence. It has a result. It has something it produces in our lives. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Now it's worked on us. We're saved. It's by grace. It's through faith. It's not of ourselves. But then it transforms our lives. That grace of God brings salvation to us, makes us now his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's not talking about the natural creation. It's talking about a new creation. He says we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I want you to understand there are many people that misunderstand the good works. Any work we do before salvation counts as nothing. Because he just told us in verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. So, we cannot say we had good works, righteous works, 
and we have something commendable before salvation. But after that salvation, it says now, we need to understand, we are not saved in vain. We are not saved to continue the way we were. It says now we are saved and we are recreated unto good works, which God has before ordained. What that means is that God has stipulated. God already has put it down. Anyone that is saved by grace, this is the expectation. And this is the fulfillment of that new work of grace in his life, which God before us ordained that we should work in them. It's not something new that you'll be cracking your brain and asking, now I am saved, now I'm born again. What am I going to do? How am I going to demonstrate that salvation? It says God has already stated that. He has ordained that. He has put that down. All you need to do now is to read the word of God and say, oh yes, this is how a child of God should walk. That's what that is saying. I want to make this a clearer. I'm sure all of us here already have understanding of what we are talking about. But it's good to refresh our memories. We're talking on salvation by grace through faith. Salvation by grace through faith. And as the teachers of the word, you know, sometimes you, you're thinking of what to preach and how to preach and how to put the topic. Look at verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And as we turn that around, that just simply means salvation because it says in that verse 8, you are saved. And then it says, by grace, that's already there, and then through faith. So, the message is taken from that verse, salvation by grace through faith. Salvation is an indispensable experience. An indispensable experience is an experience you cannot do without. If you want to know the Lord, if you want to be part of the family of God, if you want to get to heaven, it says salvation is an indispensable experience. It's a non-negotiable message in evangelism. The Lord has sent us, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And as we're preaching to every creature, our goal in preaching to them is to bring them to the kingdom of God. And so it's a non-negotiable message in evangelism. You cannot bargain with the people you are evangelizing whether to preach about salvation or not. That's the essential thing to preach about. And you cannot debate within yourself, am I to preach salvation? Am I to preach something before salvation? Well, whatever you preach before salvation, if you don't get them to the point of understanding salvation and getting saved, it's like you've wasted time because it is a non-negotiable message in uh, evangelism. And it's a non-negotiable assurance through conversion uh, by the Savior. After we're saved, it's important we know how to keep what we have got. The place of the Heavenly Father in securing that salvation. The place of Christ in securing that salvation. The place of the Holy Spirit in securing that salvation. And the place of the possessor of that salvation. That is the believer that has that salvation to understand, how do I get this secured? That nothing can touch this. How do I get this secured? That the enemy of my soul that is roaming about and as a running lion seeking whom he may devour and he wants to get this precious gift I have and I make sure that I'm so secured he cannot have it. Point number three, the assertion. Assertion. Assertion is another word for affirmation. The assertion of the condition of our security. The assertion of the condition of our security. We're coming to number one. Tell me your number one over there. The associates of Christians without salvation. We need to understand what is salvation. 
to understand what is salvation, we need to understand what salvation is not. What salvation is not. And this is the reason why uh, some of our friends make mistakes. And they think they are part of us. They think they are our associates. And they think they are affiliated with us. And they are going to the kingdom of God. Because they don't understand what salvation is not. And what salvation is. What salvation is not? Salvation is not natural birth, born by Christian people, committed parents, converted parents. Salvation is not natural birth. Salvation is not good morals. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't give bribe, bribes or whatever. Salvation is not baptism, infant or adult baptism. Salvation is not good works. Good works. People know me all around. That I'm a generous person. I'm a good person. A nice person. Salvation is not church membership. That we're following, you know, in the church. And we attend meetings regularly. As good as that is, that's not salvation. Salvation is not Bible knowledge. There are people that know some parts of the Bible. Or maybe they know many parts of the Bible. The knowledge of Scripture does not necessarily mean that that person is saved. Salvation is not decent dressing. Decent dressing is wonderful. It's very good. Because it shows you as a good uh, gentle man or you are a good lady. But dressing, decent dressing is not salvation. Salvation is not religious observances. There are some rites and ceremonies and whatever traditions that some churches, every church that uh, they go through and they accept, but that's not salvation necessarily. Salvation is not praying. Salvation is not fasting. Salvation is not praying and fasting. I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes. I give tithes of all I possess. I'm generous and good. I'm open-minded. Salvation is not praying and fasting. Salvation is not healing. It's good to be healed. Wonderful to be healed. And it is Christ who heals. But that's not equated to salvation. Salvation is not miracles. Salvation is not signs and wonders. Salvation is not self-justification. Self-justification. I know my life. I know my heart. I know what I do. I know what I don't do. Salvation is not the testimony of an ignorant conscience. Sometimes the conscience is ignorant. And the conscience thinks you are the best man in town and the best lady in town. Self-justification is not salvation. Salvation is not self-righteousness. I watch over my life where I go what I eat, who I be French, and all that. Salvation is not self-righteousness. Salvation is not visions and revelation. I see visions. I see revelation. God speaks to me, and God says this, and he says that. I dream. Pharaoh dreamed. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. Significant dreams. But were not born again. They didn't have salvation. Salvation is not prosperity. Salvation is not honesty and sincerity. Salvation is not fearlessness for the future. I don't care to die because I know if I close my eyes here, I'm going to heaven. There are people that are confident like that, but they're just ignorant. They're ignorant of the demands of the Lord, and therefore they are fearless, fearless of the future. That's not salvation. Salvation is not protection. Before any accident happens, I have an intuition. I seem to know that something is going to happen. I escape accident this time, this time, that time. Salvation is not protection. Salvation is not long life. You know how old I am? All my colleagues have died. And all those people, even people who, are, who appear to be better than I am, they have all gone. But you know, God is watching carefully over me. Salvation is not long life. Salvation is not 
a generally good life, comportment, conduct, character. All that is not salvation. All those things are good. And all those things may have their place. But we need to know what salvation is. What salvation? Salvation is a supernatural experience. Not natural. Salvation is something supernatural. That there comes a point in your life. A moment in your life. That you go to God because you know no man can do this for you. You cannot do this for yourself. And you go to God and you say, Lord, I want this salvation. I desire this salvation. And he gives that to you. And it's a, it's an, it's a supernatural experience. Salvation is the new birth. The new birth. You are born again. You are born from above. You are born anew. You are born spiritually. You get yourself to the Lord. You know you are dead. And now you want to come alive. And salvation is a new birth. Salvation is forgiveness and freedom. Not just forgiveness. Salvation is forgiveness and freedom. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because you know you are a sinner. You come to God and you're asking for pardon. You're asking for forgiveness. But you're not just asking for forgiveness and having a license to go back and keep on doing what you were doing before. Number one, there's forgiveness. The other side of the coin of salvation is freedom. Salvation is, for, is a conversion. It converts us. We call it transformation. Our lives are turned around the salvation and except you are converted and become as little children, you will in no wise get into the kingdom of God. And so salvation is conversion. Salvation is a new life. A new life. Somebody comes to the Lord and is born again and he has salvation. He has a new life. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Salvation is regeneration. It is a recreation. It's a transformation. It's regeneration. The New Testament uses all these words concerning inner salvation. Salvation is reconciliation with God. We were separated from God. And now we come to God and we're reconciled with him by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is spiritual cleansing. I will sprinkle water upon you and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness will I cleanse you. That's salvation. Salvation is redemption. Redemption. We were in the slave market. And we couldn't help doing what we were doing. But now he came and he purchased us. He bought us. Salvation is peace with God. Before salvation were the enemies of God. We had the condemnation in our hearts. Confusion in our hearts. The burden of pain and damnation in our hearts. And now we come to God. A load is lifted. The condemnation is gone. You feel light within. There is an experience that shows that now there is no condemnation in your heart. You have peace with God. Salvation is justification. It's like you are brought into the law court. And then everything condemns you. Your conscience condemns you. Your neighbors condemn you. And the law of God condemns you. And the Spirit of God condemns you. And here comes your advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, yes, he is guilty, but I bore his guilt. I bore his condemnation. And so you are justified and you are let go. That you will not go through the punishment anymore. Salvation is righteousness imputed righteousness we had no righteousness before but now he imputes and imparts righteousness unto us in short salvation is eternal life eternal life 
That is, we come to the Lord and He gives us something beyond the natural life, the animal life, the normal life that we have. And He gives us the very life of God and is referred to as eternal life. Without that salvation, all else will be eternally worthless. Without this salvation, religion will become eternally worthless. Without salvation, every other thing we do, we go to camp, we go to this, we go to that, we read the Bible, we fast, we give money to the beggars, we do a lot of things without salvation, this kind of salvation, all else is eternally worthless. We're talking about associates of Christians without salvation. We're coming to Philipp, um, Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And you are sick wicked who are dead in, sin, in trespasses and sins. When in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all urge our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. There are people who are still in their natural state, in their natural life, in the way they were born, just like it says, they're still dead in sins and trespasses. The life of God has not come to turn everything around and give them life from above. And they're still in their past life. Nothing has ever changed since they were born. And they go to church and they identify with Christians and they associate with Christians and they affiliate themselves with people who say they are going to heaven but if the change has not occurred and they are not born again they will regret forever if they die in that condition let's show you some of them John chapter 2 from verse 23 John chapter 2 verse 23 now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles which he did, many believed in his name. If I follow this man, every time I'm sick, he'll heal me. If I follow this man, everything there's a need, he can turn water to wine. If I follow this man, I don't have to sweat anymore. Provision will be coming. If that is the faith, because we saw the miracles, and we feel that if we follow him, miracles will always be happening, there's no forgiveness and freedom. There's no eternal life. There's no change of life. And there is no supernatural experience. And there is uh, no new birth. There's no regeneration. We're just associates of the Christians. Look at verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was a man. And so you find those people, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Complete the sentence. Is it just for miracle? Is it just for bread and butter? Is it just for signs and wonders? I believe. Complete that sentence. Do you believe unto life eternal? Unto salvation. Salvation from sin. And salvation that produces a new life. In John chapter 6. We're reading from verse 24. John chapter 6, verse 24. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping 
and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. They came, they left their cities, they left their abode, and they were seeking for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they actually crossed over, they crossed the sea. It says, they said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, obviously they respected him. When camest thou hither? Look at the answer of Jesus. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. You seek me, not because that supernatural experience has taken place in your heart, because you ate the loaves and you were filled, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man, tell me, shall give. They didn't have it yet. Everlasting life, eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him as the Father sent. And they didn't reply and say, oh, we have that already. Spiritual experience, that personal relationship with God, reconciliation, we have that already. No, they said, then said they unto him, what shall we do? That we might work the works of God. You see that they missed what he was saying. They missed the emphasis. There are many people that miss the emphasis on salvation. The Lord is telling them, all these things are worthless except you are saved. Except you have eternal life. And then he told them, seek not for the meat that perishes, but seek for that life, everlasting life. The one that endures unto life eternal. And then is the Son of Man that will give that to you. You know what they were interested in? What shall we do? That we might work the works of God. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. This is all that he requires. This is the effort you need to make. And this is what you need to give yourself to, that he believe on him whom he hath sent. Believe on him. That is the only one that can give you everlasting life. Well, they then ask, okay, how is that work? What are you giving to us? He began to explain to them. Look at verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? They were not saved. And yet, they were running after Christ. Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They said, were disciples. And yet, they went back. Associates they were. We're looking at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. We're reading from verse 4. In John chapter 12, verse 4, Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which shall betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? I'm sure you know the story. This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because was a convert, because he had eternal life, because he was generous, what's that? Tell me out loud. Because he was a thief. At that time, he was a thief. I come back to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away when those people had left? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
Thou hast the word of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve? Read the last part of that sentence. And one of you is, is, present sentence, at that time. Even though he was following physically. And of course, when he first came to the Lord, he must have had the same experience that all the others had. But now, at this time, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you, an associate, a friend, a so-called disciple, and one who is part of us, says at this time, one of you is a thief. We're looking at Acts chapter 8. Associates of Christians without salvation. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. We're reading from verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Come to verse 12. In verse 12, But when they, the people of the city, believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, who were baptized both men and women, then Simon himself believed also. Simon himself believed also. Uh, we must be very careful of, uh, you know, they believe without repentance. They believe without quitting occultism. But they believe without abandoning their sorcery. They believe without canceling their membership in a secret society. They believe without totally abandoning all the books and all the regalia and everything associated with witchcraft. Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Let's read now from verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Not only that he was corrupt, he wanted to corrupt the apostles, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Then Peter, but Peter said unto him, Tell me, Do real believers, will the real believers perish? For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not, tell me, perish, but have everlasting life. But this one, that money perish was thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased. Look at those words, gift to be purchased. Gift. If it's a gift, we don't purchase gifts. But you don't understand. You don't understand the faith because you thought the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. You're not a Christian. You're not born again. You don't have this supernatural experience. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right with God. Repent, therefore. You should have done this before you said you believe. Repent, therefore, of this, the wickedness, and pray, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. You need forgiveness and freedom, salvation. You need eternal life, salvation. 
you need this supernatural experience but you see these people that just associate with Christians yet they lack salvation Titus chapter 1 verse 16 Titus chapter 1 verse 16 they profess that they know God but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate and so we understand there are people that associate with Christians and they associate with the church and yet this indispensable experience they don't have examine yourself whether you be in the faith point number two our assurance through conversion by the Savior if we have this salvation the Lord will make us know because if we don't know we are kind of doubting if I leave this place where would I go where would I spend eternity am I sure beyond any shadow of doubt that I have this salvation we must be sure our assurance through conversion by the Savior understand it is through conversion it is not I feel I am saved not feeling I think I am saved not thinking people call me brother they call me sister I think they are telling me I am saved my counselor told me don't doubt don't doubt that's how it happens to people you are saved you see it on the strength on the basis of what your counselor said somebody is following up after me and he has told me anytime the devil says you are not saved just repeat repeat you might have to repeat it seven times or 20 times or 40 times i'm saved i'm saved i'm saved until you brainwash yourself i am saved do we have to go through that kind of psychology or is there something that the bible has revealed very clearly that we can know that we are saved our assurance through conversion by the savior conversion conversion is a change of direction i've been going this way before my mind is no more there again something has happened inside my heart something happened in my mind i don't love that anymore conversion is a change of trust the sinner that trusted in the devil the sinner that trusted in witchcraft the sinner that trusted in juju power the sinner that trusted in the works of darkness now he believes in the lord jesus christ there is a change of trust that he doesn't trust all that anymore i abandon them no confidence in them anymore jesus died for me even me conversion a change of trust a change of submission sinner the sinners who submit themselves to any power they think might help them but now i have received jesus as my savior and lord and i submit to the leadership and the rulership and the lordship of christ it's a change of trust what's conversion is a change of mind a change of mind the way i used to think my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways i've changed my mind come on are you going with us to the beer parlor tonight i've changed my mind are you going with us to worship uh, the idol of our extended family i've changed my mind are you going to get this done before you can get a job because you know if you're going to get job now you have to go and wash in that river and wash here and there i've changed my mind conversion is a change of mind conversion is a change of friendships 
the people that we used to, you know, like and then we used to follow up and down because they are seen partners. We love them, we liked them, and we did things for them. Now, if we're truly converted, there is a conversion that is referred to as a change of friendships, is a change of character. That's you like to fight, you like to steal, you like to do whatever, but now things are different. Things are different. You don't just have the desire to do that anymore. Lying was your trademark, but now you just don't like that anymore because you know Satan is the father of liars all over the world. But now the one you are following says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There's a change of character. There's a change of likes and dis dislikes. Change of likes and dislikes. The people you liked before, we're not talking about love is different. Love is different. Uh, the word of God says you love your neighbor as yourself. That one you love because the commandment of God says love. You can love people you don't like. You don't like their attitude. You don't like their behavior. You don't like their dressing. You don't like their comportment. But you love them because the Bible says love them. But now your likes are different. There's a change of likes and dislikes. The people I didn't like before, you know, uh, those people they carry big Bibles all about and they dress in this dummy kind of dress. I didn't like them. And the people that every time God is on the throne, Jesus will help you. Je I didn't like what they were saying. But now I'm born again. Now I'm a child of God. There is conversion. Conversion is a change of likes and dislikes. Conversion is a change of dealings. The way you dealt with people in business and the way you transacted business, the Spirit of God is saying inside you, you can't do that anymore. You can't do that business anymore because there is a change of dealings. There is a change of devotion. A change of devotion. You find somebody who is truly born again. Really a child of God. He was uh, devoted to all these, uh, you know, local games and that they push this and push that in draft or chess. Or so. His devotion was all like that. Even if there's no, there's no time to eat, he is devoted to that thing. All of a sudden, he's born again, and now he buys a Bible. And he's now devoted to the Bible. He wants to know why Christ came, what Christ did, what Christ said. He wants to know all about this Christ. He says, I'm getting saved at this late hour. I want to read and devour the Bible. There's a change of devotion. There's a change of loyalty. A change of loyalty. You know, those people that belong to secret cause, they are committed to this secret and they are loyal to them. They are loyal to them. And they are loyal to them be beyond being loyal to their wives or their husbands or loyal to their father or their mother or loyal to their family relations. They are loyal to those uh, secret societies, but not they are really born again. And uh, they used to attend this uh, meeting and that meeting and that meeting. Now they are born again in their heart. The desire for that is taken away. They are given another heart. They are following another direction of life. That's a change of loyalty. That's a change of worship. A change of worship. In the past, they didn't see anything wrong. They're worshipping like this and worshipping like that. But now, they're born again. And they're just looking for the truth to worship God in spirit and in truth. A change of worship. But you know, these people who say, I'm born again, I'm born again. And you can see very clearly that this way of worship is a way of perdition. They say, do you say this is wrong? Do you say I shouldn't worship like this? Do you say I shouldn't, uh, you know, go to that shrine or whatever? That's not being born again. Salvation is conversion. And the reason we have assurance is that we have the assurance through that conversion by the Savior. And uh, let's come to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. 
chapter 18 rather and i'm reading from verse 3 matthew chapter 18 verse 3 here the lord jesus christ said and said verily i say unto you except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven conversion very essential conversion indispensable conversion in non-negotiable except ye be converted acts of the apostles chapter 3 acts chapter 3 we're reading from verse 19 acts chapter 3 verse 19 repent therefore and be converted you see the word repent repent turn around and be converted repent abandon darkness come to the light and be converted repent leave those things that the devil is dictating influencing you and pushing you and driving you to do repent of that throw that away all the old life bundle everything together as useless rags that were ashamed of and then throw all that away and be converted repent you're walking in this direction is the way of the world is the broad way that leads to perdition is the way of the natural man and at the end of it is perdition and damnation and condemnation and you want to get to heaven repent turn around and face the light and come to jesus the light of the world it is that thorough repentance that you feel ashamed of the old life and you feel sorrowful about the old life and you say how could i be so long in darkness how could I be so long in evil? How could I be so long in waywardness? And then you say, I need an urgent transformation. I cannot go a minute more, a day more. In that life, I must turn around. That's repentance. And you do that not with laughter. You do that with sorrow of mind. You do that with shame. You do that with regret that this is the life you have lived. And then you turn around and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who has power to save. Look at that verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. That's salvation. The remembrance of the sin will be blotted out. Even in your mind, the Lord blots it out. The Lord cleanses you. I mean, there's a freedom inside you that praise the Lord, my sins are gone. And then he says, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities he turns you away from those iniquities it's not like you know i used to be a heavy smoker i'm now a light smoker i used to be a heavy drunkard i'm now a light drinker i used to belong to seven calls but now i've reduced it to three i used to mess up my life every day but now just like once a week or once in a while no he turns you away from all your iniquities brothers and sisters this is salvation and those people were following up it's good to encourage people but you don't want to de you don't want to deceive people with encouragement you don't want to tell a child of the devil who is still obviously a child of the devil you don't want to say well you're a child of god now i say and i confirm who are you to say and to confirm are you an apostle are you christ are you god i say you are born again check up in your bible where do you find that that anybody whether an apostle or a prophet will say you are born again let them tell you and let's see the evidence of that new birth lest we deceive people and then we nail them to the point 
They are not going to repent anymore because Pastor so and so says I'm born again. Mommy so and so says I'm born again. And because of that, although I see this, this and that, I'm born again. Don't deceive people. Repentance is of shame and sorrow and pain in your heart that you've done evil. Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse ten. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. When we repent, we hate the sin that dominated our lives before. When we repent, we are ashamed of the life we lived in the past. When we repent, we do not talk in a pleasant way, in a favorable way, as if we're saying, can I tell you, I was a tough man. Can I tell you, I was, when I was in the world, I was a tough woman. In fact, I don't know what, there's nothing anybody drinks now that I didn't drink. Are you saying that joyfully? Are you ashamed of that? Are you sorrowful that that was the kind of life you live? You see here, for godly sorrow, walketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of. That's that word there. Not to be repented of, regretted of, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. It changes our lives. It converts us. It turns our lives around. And that conversion is the real essential thing. Not just, it's good they follow us to the church. It's good they follow us to us fellowship. It's good they are associating with us. But never forget conversion. Conversion. Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 3. In Acts chapter 15 verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church. They passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. Declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Unto all the brethren. James chapter 5, reading from verse 19. James chapter 5, we're reading from verse 19. In James chapter 5 verse 19 and verse 20, here is what it says, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, err from the truth, and one convert him. You see, a sinner who has not known the truth, who has never known the truth, when he's converted, he comes to the truth. If he says, I'm converted, but I don't like doctrine. I'm converted, I don't like Bible. I'm converted, I don't like the truth. I'm converted, I don't want to know whatever you want to say about Christ, about heaven, about hell. No, I don't want that, but I'm converted. Uh -uh. When somebody is converted, he's brought into the truth. In fact, a backslider who had backsliding from following after the Lord. Brethren, if any of you believers do hear from the truth and one convert him, verse 20, let him know that he which converts the sinner, he which transforms the sinner, converted the sinner from the error of his ways. Somebody is uh, going to a place of false doctrine. A place they call by any name, but you know it's satanic. You know it's occultic. You know it's just a shrine, not a church. You know it's uh, like, you know, juju and magic. And that's where he's been going. Now he says, I am converted. You know what? Let him know. That she which converted the sinner from what? Tell me out loud. 
from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Point number three now. The assertion of the condition of our security. Security means that we're saved and we're kept saved. There are people that say it's unconditional. That is, you're saved, you're always saved. Because to them, there is no condition. And their favorite uh, sentence is this. Once a child, always a child. Once a son, always a son. But you know, they make a great mistake in that. If you apply that principle, once a son, always a son, come back to Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And you are see quickly who are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh, tell me, in the children of disobedience. So if you bring in the natural, uh, the natural birth, and you say, once you are born into a family, and you are a son, you are a daughter in that family, you are always a son, you are always a daughter. It doesn't work that way. Then we can say, it's impossible for anybody to be saved, because once a son of the devil, once a daughter of the devil, always a son, always a daughter of the devil. That principle will actually work against our spiritual lives. We're coming to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, reading from verse 44. In John chapter 8, verse 44, ye of your father, the devil, and the laws of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and about not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Ye of your father, the devil. If we say, once a son, always a son. All right, all people have been sons and daughters of the devil. That means... There's no hope. Because once a son, always a son. And there are people that rely heavily on the natural birth to demonstrate or to illustrate the spiritual birth. When it says, ye must be born again, they will always say, you know, tell the people they are preaching. They say, you know, it's like the natural birth. You are like this and now you are born into your family. You know, those illustrations are tricky and dangerous. Number one, you didn't choose to be born naturally. It wasn't your choice. The choice of your father, the choice of your mother, that was not in your hand. The choice of the place you were born, that was not in your hand. But in the spiritual, you have to choose the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to believe. You have to make a personal choice that I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and so I'm saved. In the natural birth, you didn't have to do anything to cause the natural birth. But in the spiritual birth, you have to do something to cause that spiritual birth. You have to repent. Repent ye and believe the gospel. In the natural birth, you didn't determine your day of birth. You didn't say, "My, I like the 1st of January, and I'm going to be born on the 1st of January. It was not in your hand. In the spiritual birth, the day is in your hand. This is the day of salvation, and you call upon the Lord today. And it is that day you call that you are going to be saved. In the natural birth, it didn't require anything, hearing a message or listening to anything. In the spiritual birth, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. 
The point is, you cannot associate the natural birth and the spiritual birth and say, as it is in the natural birth, so it will always be in the spiritual birth. It's a kind of illustration that leads you astray. And so we cannot say on the Christian security, security of the believer, that after all, once a child, always a child, once you're born again, always born again, it's erroneous and it's false. Now, about the condition of a security, how do you get secured? Remain a child of God. Here are the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 12. Be and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be seen. And there is an effort from you. There's a desire from you. There's a decision from you. Temptations will come. Trials will come. Difficulties will come. But you say, I am saved. I want to remain saved. Salvation was by the grace of God and through faith. But my choice was there. Many are called, but few are chosen. And I decided I was going to be chosen. I'm going to be saved. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm saved. I want to remain saved. I know about heaven, and I want to get there. And I know about hell. I don't want to get there. I am going to endure. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, Mark chapter 13, it tells us here, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Look at verse 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour, no, it's no man, no, not the angels of God, which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed. You have to do something to remain safe. Take heed. And watch, and watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. Look at verse 37. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, watch. We have a duty. We have a responsibility. The Father wants to keep us. He has the power to keep us. But we need to watch. And we need to make up our minds. I'm saved. I will not be lost. In Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Reading from verse 31. So likewise ye. When you see these things come to pass. Know ye that the kingdom of God it's nice at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Verse 34, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness. Take heed. He's talking to believers. Let your heart be overcharged with sophity and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that they come upon you unawares. For as the snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore. You have something to do. You are saved. You want to keep saved. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. John chapter 15. John chapter 15, reading from verse 1. John 15, from verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband man. Every branch in me, born again, every branch in me, having the same life that I have, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, tell me, it taketh away. 
every branch in me. And that's not the devil taking them away. The Father taking them away. Because it's not bearing fruit. Because it's not showing the life, the vitality of an abiding believer. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bear more fruit. Look at verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Look at verse 6. If a man abide not in me, a man is born again, he has eternal life, is a child of God, but he goes away from the Lord of his own volition. If a man abide not in me, he is cast off as a branch, and is, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. Verse 7, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Uh, there is an important passage in Acts of the Apostles, a good illustration. Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. You see, there are people that look at the promises of God. There are many promises in the Word of God. But then, they do not look at the other side of the issue. They say, look at what God has promised. I keep unto them eternal life. They're reading that from John chapter 10. And they shall not perish. That's from John. Because my Father that gave them to me is greater than all. And no man can pluck them out of my hand. So far, so good. Keep on reading and read chapter 15 and balance it up. Let's balance it up now. Look at Acts chapter 27. And I'm reading from verse 22. Note what it says. Acts 27. Are you there? Acts 27 verse 22. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you. There shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the sheep. Why? For there stood by me. This night, the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Verse 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. That's security. I said that's security. But look at this, verse 31. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. As you look at verses 22 to 25, that's the promise of security. Because God has the power to keep. And he said, Paul, don't be afraid. I've given you all the men. And they're going to be saved. And no life will be lost. Now, as the ship went on. As it was coming to the shore. They feared something. And they were about to jump into the river. And then Paul, the apostle, turned around and said, Can I give you the other side of the coin? Can I show you that... This security is not an automatic security. Except these abide in the sheep, ye cannot be saved. Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, verse 22, conditional security of the believer. Romans chapter 11, verse 22, Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God, on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue. Toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut 
up. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty where we is, Christ has made us free. He tells us there, Christ has made us free. As for the salvation of these people, no doubt they were saved. Because he says, stand fast in that liberty. Well, with Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again of the yoke of bondage. But look at verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. You see, we balance it up. God has power. He can keep. But we must have the desire to be kept. We must avoid temptation. We must live a holy life. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look at verse 3. If I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that is a debtor to do the whole law, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are falling from grace. And so you see how important it is to keep in the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house we are if. As a condition here. If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. Verse 12. Take it brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You are being with the living God. You are abiding in the living God. Take heed that you don't depart, but exhort one another daily. Whilst it is called today, lest any of you be hiding through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence, steadfast, tell me, unto the end. God's promise, God's power, God's grace are sufficient to keep us. He is faithful and is able to keep, just as able to save. Yet, He does not save anyone against His will. Neither does He keep anyone against His will. There must be that willingness. I want to be kept. I want to abide. I want to stay in the Lord. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is great, is the great shepherd. He saves, he keeps. He is more powerful than the adversary of our souls. His grace is sufficient for us. He can save to the uttermost. Yet, he demands that we believe. He demands that we obey. He demands that we abide. He demands that we stay with him and continue in his watch unto the very end. That's how to be secured in the Lord. The Holy Ghost intercedes, strengthens, empowers, teaches, guides, protects. He is to abide forever, revealing Christ and meeting our needs to prepare us for heaven for glory. Yet we are warned not to grieve the Spirit and not to do despite to the Spirit of grace. Our security is conditional. There is security for all who trust and commit themselves unreservedly unto the Lord. Multitudes will get to heaven. I pray you'll be one of them. Revelation. Chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Reading from verse 9. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes 
and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to our God which seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Notice that salvation to our God who seated upon the throne and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped the worship God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are rich in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, a day before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that seated on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun, that the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. It says, these came from great tribulation. And they are able to make it. With all the pressure, all the pain, all the trials, the grace of God was sufficient to keep them. But they made up their minds, temptation will not stop me. Trials will not stop me. Tribulation will not stop me. Great tribulation will not stop me. If God could preserve this great multitude and he could go through all that, there's no great tribulation today for you. There's healing. There's deliverance. There are promises. There's the promise of God. There are pastors. There's a church. There's everything. If these people could make it, you can make it. Just make up your mind. Whatever the challenge, I am saved. I will keep saved until that final day. I see people who will keep it on the final day. The Lord will keep you. His grace is sufficient for you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Now we understand salvation fully. And we understand what salvation is. And thank God we've got it. Check up yourself. Check up on yourself. How is it with you? And tell the Lord that the grace of God be sufficient for you in your life. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.